like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, the CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled Open Innovation Campus. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin. First, all phones have been muted except for the presenters. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides will be posted on our website within a few days. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. My pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Ms. Karen Roth. Karen is the Chief Engineer of the Air Force Research Laboratory Information Directorate. She is the um, Technical Engineering Authority, providing counsel on systems engineering and pro programmatic matters. <coughs> uh, I'm going to turn the uh, briefing over to Karen. Uh, floor is now yours. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Steve, and welcome to everyone for this briefing. As Steve said, my name is Karen Roth. Um, as the Chief Engineer up at the Information Directorate in Rome, New York for the Air Force Research Laboratory, one of the things that I've been working on is the, the concept of open innovation and what does it mean to us as uh, the Information Directorate how can we take advantage of those concepts and how can we use it to expand our partnerships and really open the front door? We found that throughout the years that um, the, the front door can remain closed to those that aren't within the defense community understand how it works. And we really want to open that up to more non-traditional partners, um, people with new ideas, new concepts, and how to integrate those into everything that we do. The information directorate in Rome, we focus on C4I uh, plus one uh, is what we call it. So um, your traditional uh, command control, communications, infrastructure, those kinds of things, plus cyber. So our main core competencies are really in cyber, command and control, communications and networking, and what we call processing exploitation. So understanding how to bring in uh, data and analytics and how to put those back out into useful formats for the military use. And those main focus areas of ours and what we've always worked on has really been the core focus of the National Defense Strategy as it's come out, um, the new one that we got last year, as well as the um, Air Force 2030 study. If you haven't seen that, that's a great science and technology read in terms of where the Air Force is going, what their future vision is, um, and how we need to get there. One of the things that they specifically call out is the open innovation concept. What we found, though, is looking across the country um, at other open innovation groups is that everyone does it a little bit differently. And so we really wanted to focus primarily on the partnerships. Is it isn't about a facility, it isn't about um, technology, it isn't about this, it's about how do we enable partnerships with our community and really double down on that concept in terms of open innovation. So we've kind of created um, a business model around that and how we're moving forward that does include some physical aspects um, as well as some challenge problems and how we're going to get there for tomorrow. So as I said, it's it's really about the partnerships and the agility. Uh, I recently just came back from the Air Force Association Conference. Uh, if you weren't able to attend that, I would very much recommend uh, looking at some of the videos of what happened. Uh, they put on quite a show, but they also said repeatedly over and over and over, and this is our top leaders of the Defense Department as well as the Air Force, that innovation is their priority, digital is their priority, um, as Dr. Roper said, being deft, and so he's using that terminology to mean being agile, being quick, um, and actually being able to rapidly take advantage of the commercial sector and what they're doing as well. 
Uh, we can't continuously assume that the government will be the leader in technology moving forward and that there's going to be areas, especially in this cyber community, where commercial is going to take the lead on this and we need to take advantage of that and be able to tweak and adjust that for the defense needs as well moving forward. And so that's where we're really considering ourselves um, in the information directorate to be part of the ecosystem and not the lead of the ecosystem anymore. So that's where that open innovation concept really comes in and opening our front door to new ideas, new partnerships as well. So overall, the goals and strategy, um, as I said, it, it really comes out of both the National Defense Strategy and the Air Force 2030 strategy. But at the end of the day, it's very simple. How do we link researchers from government, industry, and academia and be able to share the brightest people, ideas, facilities, um, all of that virtually and in person? So to us, that means how do we put our people into the right communities, whether or not that be virtually or actually sending them on special assignments to different locations, to make sure that they're in the right infrastructure and that we're inviting people back in turn virtually to work with us and that we're enabling networking and communication and also inviting relevant partners to work directly in our facilities as well. We don't want to get into a mindset where, you know, everyone's working on AIML, but they're all working on the same AIML problems. We really want to share and collaborate uh, whether or not it be ideas, facilities, talent problems, people, um, and get them in the right places having those same conversations. So that way, rather than having a team of five tackling a certain AIML problem, then we've got a team of, you know, 20 or 30 all working on the same challenge problem together, communicating clearly and amongst each other. And that includes, like I said, it includes other government partners, it includes our industry partners, and especially our academic partners as well in all of that. Um, the other piece of this is making it so that way as we do these collaborations, we're including our partners, like our partnership intermediaries, and we're including our state and local partners as well in all of this conversation. Because the more that we're able to bring up this ecosystem, the more that we can bring jobs to the community, the more that we can impact the economy. And so asking our partners in on this conversation and to be part of our, our new way forward will help enable, they'll be able to bring resources to the table as well that we can take advantage of back in turn. And we should be acting as you know, partners all together working through this strategy. So for us that means so government, external government stakeholders is um, everyone from our, our, our partners like NASA, like other innovation institutes like AFWorks, um, like CyberWorks, and making sure that the challenges that we're working on and doing, that we're working on them in lockstep. So we've been having conversations with people um, like AFWorks in terms of you know, you look for challenges in order to seed your problems. How can we give you those challenges and then use your infrastructure and your connections in order to find the right teams in order to take on them? It means going out and working with universities and saying, how can we give ideas for senior projects and then mentor back? How can we have conversations on what your curriculum looks like and what inputs can we have into that? Um, and then within the information directorate, it's really taking best advantage of all of the great things that we already do today, but having a different twist on that. And so making sure that we're using the authorities that we have to the best of our ability. So today we already have, um, we already have some great facilities of our own um, that we work in our secure and classified space. We already have access to a great contractor base. But how do we then supplement that with more cooperative research agreements? How do we supplement that with facilities where we can work better with our foreign national partners? How can we supplement that with um, a better training program for that not only impacts us, but also the community as well? Uh, how do we better take advantage of our educational partnership agreements that we have with universities and continue to to 
spur that economy through that because the better that the teams around us become, the better that we as AFRL become as well. And then at the bottom is talking more about those state and local partners as well. Um, it's everyone from Griffith Airport and the vision that they have for the future in building up that community um, to our different partnership intermediaries are one of them being Griffiths Institute, one of them being NICE Tech, and taking advantage of those partnerships to the fullest and those uh, capabilities that we have there. So the, the first step we said whenever kind of tackling the way forward is we didn't talk about what infrastructure we were missing. We talked about what does our future look like? What are the challenges that we need to tackle tomorrow in order to enable today? So we, we got together with all of our core technical competency leads um, and those core areas that I talked about previously and said, what are the things that we aren't invested in today? And what are the things that we know that we need to get to tomorrow based on that national defense strategy, based on the S&T strategy, and how are we going to get there? And so with that, they had actually done a lot of work with our Air Force Office of Scientific Research already to kind of define some of those challenges and were able to turn around a series of about 20 challenges and said, these are the things that we don't have perfect answers for today that we've been doing some work in, but we don't have um, we need more work, we need more ideas, we need more um, out-of-the-box ideas, more people that are looking at things in different ways, um, and those different challenges and said, all right, this is where we want to go for tomorrow and where the, the applied programs in the laboratory of the future are going to be. And so I know that you don't have time to read this today, but I wanted to leave these on the slide so that way you had them when Steve um, sent them to all the participants afterwards. But just to give you some background, they include things like one of our primary challenges in the, is in quantum computing, making sure that um, we've got algorithm optimization, that we're prepared to take advantage of the quantum revolution that's coming. Um, there are things like in cyber, talking about cyber metrics. What does a cyber metric really look like? in terms of um, cyber quantification and cyber effect. So these aren't necessarily Air Force mission problems. These are the, these are the fundamental basic research problems that we need to solve in order to enable the mission and the way forward on this. And so you can see it includes things like quantification of multi-domain effects. So when you're doing effects across um, airspace and cyber, how do you really quantify that? Um, and these kinds of challenges, so quantification and metrics are especially important for commanders, that when they're making the decision on what tools for what environment, for um, what mission they're trying to use, that they have the proper information on the impact and effects that will go along with that. And then this is kind of the rest of the series of those challenges, which again, I'll leave you to read for later. Um, my email is in the front of this slide deck, so please feel free to reach out at any point in time and have that conversation with me, though. Um, and we can get you in contact with the right people and the path forward on that. So after we, we did that, we said, all right, this is, this is our, these are our challenges. What is it that we need to get to today that we can't do in order to enable these. So one of the things we said was our quantum team. Um, they have difficulties working with all of the international partners that they would like to work with. This is really an international challenge at this point in time. It isn't being, um, and it's being tackled from every different angle from people all across the world. Um, so they had challenges working with their international partners um, as well as some other challenges. Um, we said we want to put together a hub for Kessel Run. So Kessel Run is a uh, rapid DevSecOps uh, software factory hosted in Boston that one of the program offices runs. And we said we want to be an actual node in this. 
we want to be participating in this. We want to put our research into making this pipeline better um, and be a direct partner with this organization. But they work completely outside of the network, completely on basic research in the open. So how do we work in that community as well? Uh, we want to be able to expand current programs that we already have that we're space constrained on, um, like our cyber program where we train um, our future cyber um, operators in our different methodologies or equipment. We invite international participation in this to enable those partners. Um, things like expanding our small business outreach um, as well. So especially our small businesses can actually come in and work in our environment with us and do some of those kinds of things that are that are challenges for us in Rome today. And then we also really wanted to focus on some of our corporate relationships as well. Uh, the SUNY system being a big one. So whenever by acting as kind of the head of the ecosystem like we were doing, it would put the burden on us to look across all of the universities, all the all the different work going on across all these different organizations and try and figure out where the best was versus leaning on our partners to say, help us locate who the best people are to work with on our challenges. So the SUNY system has dozens of different universities as part of it. And SUNY is actually committed to hosting business development people right with us in AFRL and making sure they understand what we're trying to do what the opportunities are and enabling that partnership directly with us so that way they can act as that conduit with the different universities in their network and bring that to bear. Um, and that includes not just working directly on those technical challenges, but also making sure that um, from a business development perspective, we have access to the small businesses that they work with. Um, we're trading intellectual property between the different systems. We can have conversations with them about curriculum um, and what we're looking to in the future. And so it really is a partnership from that perspective. Um, various universities we're working with from everything from how can we get in on the ground talking about senior projects to how can we potentially enable um, our researchers to talk to your classrooms about different topics and integrate that in. We're working with the National Security Innovation Network, um, and that's one of the organizations that has done the original hosting of the Air Force Pitch Days that you may have heard about, making sure that those concepts can be integrated with what we're doing as well. And that includes um, other innovation networks like AFWorks, and this is really just a sampling of some of the things that we're working on and talking about to kind of give you a flavor of that. So once we got all through all of that and said, all right, we know our challenges, we know where our major gaps are in order to overcome some of these, we said, what's next? Well, where do we need to go with these and how do we, how do we tackle these? And that's when we started talking to our partners, um, our main partnership intermediaries, um, as I mentioned, our Griffiths Institute, um, as well as NICE Tech. That partnership intermediary is a unique relationship that the government can have with a nonprofit organization where they enable, specifically we enable tech transition through those organizations. And they have, they connect um, on our behalf in that, those types of relationships. And, but they can't do research. That That's the main difference is they can't actually do research like a traditional contractor. But um, in the Griffiths Institute's case, an example of is they run a commercialization academy. So they're intimately familiar with what our intellectual property is, what it looks like, and how they can enable that commercialization out in the community for other types of products, for other defense needs, um, and can get that conversation out there. We have a huge intellectual property portfolio that is open and accessible with our partners through either a cooperative relationship or through things like the Commercialization Academy in order to work on. And we, it's in our best interest as a government to push that out to our partners. And that's the unique capability that we can really provide 
as the U.S. government is that our main motivator is that we want people to use what we have done in the past and what we have data rights to and do new things to it. That is in our absolute best interest. So how can we enable that? So our partners are actually both moving to new facilities. Um, this isn't something, and managing new facilities, looking at, looking at our future, looking at where we needed to go, they recognized that the facilities that they were in and hosting their businesses out of weren't going to work for the future of what we needed, but additionally, that they had their own business opportunities and their own business models that they could take advantage of as well in doing that movement. And so recognizing that as we open that front door and enable more small businesses to come to our front door, that there was opportunities for them to host those small businesses and to um, enable resources, all of those things that someone just getting started out the door may not have access to. And that enables their tech transition mission most importantly with getting the right technologies to the right people in the right time frame in order to make that happen. So the what's what's going to happen is the the county and state is investing in um, a building on the airport ground, so it's still on base um, next to the old airport, and is taking and renovating one of the old Air Force buildings that we no longer own, and turning this into an open innovation area. And that's, that's an investment on the county and state's part to say, we believe in what you're doing, AFRL. We want to make this a technology hub, and we want to make it more than just about you as well. Um, and Griffiths is then going to actually act as a, as a LEC of that um, in order to do that. So what that does for us is by using our partnership intermediary, that really gives them a lot of flexibility with that tech transition thing. It allows us to utilize that space through their tech transition agreement with our partners, and it allows us to open up our basic research portfolio and have a, a bigger conversation with a broader audience on that. And that's where, how we're opening that front door, but still protecting the sensitive work that we do within the laboratory as well. Now, NYSTEC is also moving to new facilities, and there's going to be additional collaboration space within those facilities as well to take advantage of, so that's really great. So just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what the, the proposed vision of this is, is this is kind of what the new building outside is going to look like. Now to the right, um, the county is actually taking advantage of some of this hangar space for their other interests. They're recognizing that AFRL is going to have a hub within here and doing a lot of research work in partnership with the Griffiths Institute, but also they want to make this a complex. So they want to take advantage of this other hangar space, and that includes um, looking at other opportunities for um, expanding their UAS mission. They already have that FAA test site there on site, so how do they expand that mission? How do they enable other things to come in as a result of that and kind of build on that ecosystem? So we really appreciate that, that vision that the county and our airport partners have in looking at this as more than just the AFRL challenges and that we can bring this whole ecosystem here in Rome, New York up together and it's more, just, it's more than just about the facilities and it's going to grow bigger the more partners that we bring in. Um, so there's about 40,000 square feet um, in that center area that's very unique space. So there, there was some construction challenges at being an old strategic air command base, but I think that's what makes it unique and great at the same time is that we're repurposing these old buildings um, from when it hosted um, old bombers here on base into something new and great while still maintaining that history of the base. So just to kind of give you an overview of what this is going to look like um, and what Griffiths is doing with this, is the, the first floor is actually going to get turned into hard lab space. So that includes quantum labs um, to promote that quantum mission, as well as electronic laboratories that we could um, keep equipment in. Uh, we can do work with uh, DARPA, our partners. We can do work with industry and our corporate partners to enable those missions. But we're also co-locating 
with other businesses. So the yellow part is the only part that Griffith is renting. And I think that that's the most important part to us is we really do want to be with other people. We want to be having conversations with other companies. We want to be hearing about what they're doing. And we want to give them direct access to our future challenges and where we're moving. So that way they're prepared and they're thinking about the, the change and the movement that AFRL is taking for the future and taking that into account within their R&D as well. All those kinds of things. The, the second floor is actually going to be focused on business development. And again, that's, that's an important thing for us, that business development piece, those partnerships, those corporate relationships, that training for the future. So there's going to be a huge auditorium that's going to be able to host workshops, conferences. And the best part is, is that's all available for use by any of our partners. And it's all available for use directly by working with the Griffith Institute in order to rent any of that space in order to expand into it. So, and this is where all of the current GI members are going to be sitting, working with the community, uh, working on that strategy and help to build out that future. There's several classrooms and training rooms that they're gonna host as part of that. So again, not only for enabling our training, research and workshops, but also the communities as well. So inviting the community into this space as well. This isn't closed off, this is basic research. What we're doing in these areas can be all part of this discussion. And then the third floor is actually going to be that rapid prototyping area where we focus on we're able to go into that space and our partners are able to go into that space and focus on on those challenge statements that we already talked about. It's a mix of open and closed, um, so that way it's a little bit multi-generational, and also it can host a variety of different groups and organizations as a result of that. Um, it can fit almost 200 personnel in it, which is huge, so that's gonna enable growth of our summer programs, our summer internship programs, as well as our summer vis visiting faculty and professors, um, and some of those great programs that we did do today while still enabling the growth of new programming as well. So the facility schedule is we're anticipating that um, a certificate of occupancy is in the April timeframe, is where Griffiths is looking at for right now, so that way we're prepared for next summer. So the big part of this is, is we're talking about the facility space and enabling and how that's a big enabler. But the business model that we're working on today is open for business today. We don't have to wait for this facility to be open. We as AFRL are already acting in this new model. We've been reaching out to our partners um, like Nizen um, Lab Leadership just did a big meeting down in New York City to meet new small businesses, to have conversations on who we are, what we're interested in. Uh, we met with two universities. We met with venture capitalists. Uh, we met with economic development. And some people might ask, well, what does New York City have to do with Rome? And the answer is, by spreading our conversation, by spreading our business model, by talking about our challenges to different communities, that's going to enable our community back here in Rome. That's going to enable other businesses that might be interested in moving into this area. That's going to enable us having that broader conversation on who we are and getting more people interested in the the tech, the, the real tech hub that we're building here in Rome and wanting to be part of it. And it's going to enable more people to applying, having great ideas, and expanding the mission that we have up here and that economic impact that we can have by tapping into huge tech hubs like New York City and thinking about things differently. So engaging with venture capitalists People are like, oh, venture capitalists, how do, they, how do they come in play? You have your own funding. But what we're interested in is not only of what they're investing in, but making sure they're investing in the things that we're interested in and how we can do cooperative work with some of those teams. You know, if some of their companies already have venture capital funding from somewhere else, why can't we enable that with a cooperative research agreement and trade them additional resources to enable that 
well, their return back to us is use of their technology. And this is all a no-cost exchange. And so those are the things that we're really interested in, in terms of using our authorities and our capabilities and the IP we already have to the best of our ability. So just talking about some metrics and goals for year one, we wanted to make sure that um, we rolled this out in a very reasonable way that we could um, make sure that we're bringing the community along with us as we roll this out. And we're really focusing on our top challenges along with it. So technical goals you'll see include a mix of the quantum work especially that we're looking to kick off, but also exchange of co-locates of other personnel from other organizations, as well as some of that training. And so that really does go into play that it isn't just about solving those challenge problems, but really investing in the community and the ecosystem through training courses, cooperative agreements, as well as uh, really focusing on building up the foundation so that way we can grow in the future through those more strategic goals of non finding non-traditional partners, being able to track things, uh, being able to create those metrics plans and conversations and the infrastructure up around it as well. And then just some other major ongoing activities that we're working along with it is um, things like programming, program planning. So that way you shouldn't have to, it, it seems like basic things, but we really wanna make sure that when people come to work with us, all of the background of how you work with a defense organization is kind of opaque. You shouldn't have to come in and see the 50 layers of paperwork. You shouldn't have to come in and worry about five forms in order to log into a network. You shouldn't have to come in and take a month to get through the security processes, but making sure that we're very clear that when you walk in the door, you can start work on day one. That's huge for us. The other, some other things are making sure that we have engagement agreements with innovation institutes and we have plans for them. We do want to host an open house kickoff um, to kind of formally kick off the business model and showcase uh, what the new facilities are going to look like to our community and show how those investments are going to spur our business model. Making sure that we continue to have, keep that front door open, not just open it for a little bit, have some conversations, and then kind of close it again when we feel like we've had enough conversations. It should always be that strategic outreach plan in place so we're continuously keeping that front door open. We put a doorstop in it and say, please continue to come have this conversation with us. Um, we want to do pitch days here in Rome as well as other locations and continue doing that model that's proved to be successful in other locations. And then that sustainable training pro program, not only taking advantage of our own talent, but rotating workshops, looking at certificate programs we can do with like the Air Force Institute of Technology um, or the Naval Postgraduate School or other university partners and how we can trade resources back in turn for um, great programming like this and continue to build that out. So those are kind of the big things that we're focusing on. Um, I think that we've seen a couple questions come in. So I really want to take this opportunity to be able to answer those questions. I tried really hard to make sure I defined all of my acronyms too, but I'm sure I missed a couple that you guys are going to point out to me. Um, and sometimes it's hard to turn off that defense lingo and have that conversation. But overall, um, before we kind of talk about questions, I just really want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to this conversation, um, hopefully internalize. We welcome feedback and conversation on this and recognition that this is absolutely not just a DOD, but please forward and have this conversation with your non-DOD partners. Uh, forward it out to people that aren't even involved with government types of entities and that make it clear that we're open for business, our front door is open, and we want to have these conversations. So thank you, everyone. And let's see what our questions really look like. 
Thank you, Karen. Uh, appreciate the the overview. I think this um, Open Innovation Campus is a very exciting opportunity. Uh, I think it's it'll be very important. You know, you talked about creating this uh, ecosystem uh, here, and, and actually, one of our one of our questions, one of the uh, attendees. Uh, wasn't sure where we're, lo where we're located. So uh, Air Force Research Lab Information Directorate is actually in, in Rome, New York, on the Griffiths um, Business and Technology Park. And um, uh, it, you talked about the uh, you know, state and local uh, funding. So it, it was also a question about uh, our, was it the Department of Defense? So this is a, um, a group um, uh, so it's a AFRL is obviously part of the DOD, but mm -hmm. but um, multiple partners, entities, the local uh, New York State uh, government and uh, our United County, uh, our local our local government is providing funding for this mm -hmm. uh, facility as well. But uh, the uh, and and we are starting off with our hub here in Rome, New York. But we aim to really expand this model across AFRL to our other partners in Albuquerque, to our partners at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, um, our partners at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. So across all of AFRL, our, our two-star general is really looking to us as the new business model of executing the 2030 study. Okay. And so it will be, um, it will be more than just us but we're starting here in our local community here in Rome, New York. But as we talk about partnerships, it can be much further than just our state and local partners. We're looking for partners all across the country doing great things that we're interested in. So now, uh, obviously, it's an Air Force facility here, but uh, do, you, do you see like other services uh, participating in this OIC, or do you think all, all the services are gonna kind of have their own I think the Army may have one already, but uh, do, you, do you see interaction with your uh, sister services? Oh, absolutely. And our sister services are saying the same thing, and that we want to make sure we've all got you. We've all got similar but unique challenges. So all of the services are interested in AIML. All of the services have cyber challenges. Um, they just are you have them those challenges for different mission sets. So we actually, we've done several visits down to the Army Research Laboratory in their open innovation environment that they started approximately five years ago. Um, and that innovation environment is actually specifically called out in the Air Force 2030 S&T Challenge as, some, as an organization that's doing it well. And so those conversations have been really great, not only learning best practices from them, but learning about the challenges they're tackling and how we can do collaboration amongst us as well. So that includes those innovation institute reach outs, does include our other sister services as well, so that way we can stay in lockstep with what they're doing too. It's There's so much going on everywhere that how do, how do we really tackle that from a regimented way and take advantage of some of the cool technologies that we have um, in terms of processing information and to, to bring all of that together to really look at the whole infrastructure. The Army Research Lab has a great model as well that they actually have uh, 20 or more small regional sites in their open innovation model where, so they've taken the perspective of wherever there's cool things going on, they want to put people there even if it's only two people or 10 people and expand that as a network. So we're going to look at some of that as well in the future of how we can do that. And rather than doing it ourselves, how do we partner with where the Army is already sitting and maybe put our own people there or offer to put our people in another location and then trade information and resources with the Army. Awesome. Um, so, you know, you talked about creating the, the ecosystem. So now do you see uh, uh, folks resident here physically in, in Rome or can, can they participate virtually or a combination? Um, and if they're interested in participating, so is it best to reach out with you, uh, somebody at the, if they wanted space, mm -hmm. somebody at the Griffiths Institute, what's, what's the best first step for somebody that wants to 
see how they might be able to get involved in this? So right now we're open to different kinds of opportunities. Some of the people that we've been conversing with are going to be strictly virtual, um, but some of them we do want to do co-locates with, whether or not it be us sending people out. Um, so as an example, we have two people out at Kessel Run in Boston uh, working with that program office, sitting directly in that environment. Um, we have um, someone co-located with one of our sister directorates down in Kirtland Air Force Base. We have someone sitting directly at SOCOM down in Florida. We have people sitting directly at the Pentagon. So really making sure we do value the, that sending our people to other locations is a huge opportunity for us to have that conversation. But we're also inviting people back to sit with us too, uh, whether or not it be two weeks to work on a problem or six months to work on a problem. Those opportunities are all on the table, and that's where we're saying there is no one specific way to do this. It's about where do we think the best impact in order to do the research that needs to be done and how to do that. And so that can be done in many different ways, and so that's why we're, we, we really did try to take a step back and say, because some innovation facilities have opened and said, look, this is shiny. We're going to open something shiny and they shall come. That doesn't work for long term because the, the shiny building and the shiny infrastructure and the shiny network are great, but it's really the science and technology challenges that draw the best people out and say, yeah, I want to work on this with you. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you're interested in a partnership, absolutely reach out to me and we can talk through the challenge problems um, and what we might have ability to have to trade there. Um, if you're looking more at a space kind of thing, just in terms of being in this community, um, we'll make sure that you're hooked up with the Griffith Institute and how to do that type of thing. But we can make sure that you're going in the right direction is the important thing. Okay. 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 Uh, let's see. At one point you, you mentioned, you know, participating with uh, non-traditional partners. So is that... Uh, uh, more folks that aren't typically doing business with the Department of Defense, so um, trying to mm -hmm. trying to bring in the commercial type organization or mom and pop type. What? Yeah, I think those are uh, across that whole realm, and so I think venture capitalists are a good description of that. Okay. You know why? Why, why do we want to get involved in venture capitalism? And the answer is we don't specifically want to get involved in venture capitalism, but the model that venture capitalists use to bring in new small businesses, incubate them, uh, really focus the tech that they have into creating an actual business, that's of huge interest to us. And so another part of that is um, helping to incubate small businesses um, in ways and get them to think of out-of-the-box ways to use the technology that they're working on. They may have it targeted for the medical community, but a lot of stuff that the medical community is interested in, we're interested in too. Mm -hmm. So rather than having competition, how do we take advantage and put our resources additionally into that in a similar manner? So that way we're taking advantage of that in a different way. So that's kind of what we're thinking about when we talk about non-traditional partners. Okay. And just kind of uh, so a couple comments on that. It's uh, you know work that's been going on in uh, artificial intelligence, it's different aspects, machine learning for for decades, and it seems like within the last maybe five years or so, uh, there's been huge advances, huge strides, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that has been due to the uh, venture capitalists pumping money mm -hmm. into those areas and. Um, I, th I think we have seen, you know, some significant increases and in, in advances mm -hmm. from that from that inflow of money. So, so it's a good thing. So venture mm -hmm. capitalism can be a good thing. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the ecosystem, you know, trying to create the ecosystem. So the other, you know, one of the other co kind of entities there. Uh, you mentioned the FAA test site. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a group here too that's trying to been trying to create a an ecosystem for the UAS uh, environment, mm -hmm. and I, I think we're seeing the same thing with folks, you know, investing in technology in those areas, 
and then those different businesses that are kind of sprouting up have kind of cross-pollinated and yeah. created some interesting, um, uh, you know, so with the, as those technologies develop, they're, they're seeing areas where they can collaborate and, and develop new things from their yeah. individual pieces. So, so, you know, I think you could, you could see something of that nature sprout out of your mm -hmm. OIC concept as well. So. A absolutely. And drones is something the military is certainly interested in. We invest more and look at more software applications. But by having that FAA test site right next to us, rather than seeing it as something else, we see that as, you know, that's a, that's a building that's going to be full of scientists and engineers with great ideas that are interested in this space. Even if what they're working on today isn't directly applicable to the mission, because as the information director, we do more software, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they're not having great ideas every day. That doesn't mean that if they're not hearing about our challenges, they're not going to cogitate on them and they're not going to have conversations and want to tackle that. I mean, small businesses um, really are the heart of corporate America in terms of the, the brilliant ideas that they can have and the methodologies which they have doing it. So being part of those ecosystem is really important to, to help build that up together and keep having those conversations on where we're going. Because it may not be about the, it may not be about that particular person that we talked about that day, but they're gonna take that conversation to three other people. And those may be our future partners, who knows? Yeah, and uh, so one one of your challenge problems mentions IoT, mm -hmm. and some some of the folks uh, in in UAS uh, kind of just describe you know those devices as mobile IoT units. Yeah, that's one way of thinking about it. So and, and you know so then the other thing is it's just not the uh, you know the vehicle itself. I mean, you have the the system, mm -hmm. the ground control, and I mean, there's command and control. There's situation awareness mm -hmm. uh, that are pieces of that. So, uh, so I can see synergies with a lot of other technologies in the information directorate in in that yeah. UAS as well. So I absolutely. Think and so, uh, trust is one of the big things mm -hmm. that we look at, uh, especially with avionics architectures in drones. So how can we apply a rooted layer of trust to an infrastructure that already exists? Mm -hmm. That's certainly one of our challenge problems. Um, looking at the counter UAS problem, so even if we're just looking at, you know, even if the drone technology they're working on, uh, we met with a small business that does racing drones. Okay. Um, and even if, you know, we're never going to be in the business of building racing drones, but what we are in the business of is understanding the technical infrastructure and architects and architectures that other companies are building. So that way with our counter UAS work, we can be prepared for that wave and where those technologies are going as well. Um, to be able to protect our Air Force bases, to be able to protect our assets and other locations, all of those kinds of things. So sometimes it's the talking to the people who are building things that maybe we're not in the business of, but is spurring other interest areas of ours as well. Sure. Good. Let's see if we've got some other questions here from our audience. Uh, somebody just making a comment that focuses now on counter drone at intersection of AI machine learning cyber to include blockchain, crypto, and Quantum. Absolutely. Those are all things that we're definitely interested in. Also, uh, it's just making comment to this trust trust modeling work. Uh, let's see. Some businesses do not want to knock on a venture capitalist door first. Will your program be promoting uh, OTAs and SIBRs and other types of funding? Oh, absolutely. And I'm using venture capitalists as an example of a non-traditional partner, but it's absolutely not the only route that we're looking at. Um, making sure that our the traditional great things that we do today, like OTAs and SIBRs, are all rolled into part of this. 
is the educational aspect that as people come into our infrastructure that aren't as familiar with the DOD, that they understand all of the more traditional options that we have and we work with. So even if we're working with a company, say, in a co cooperative research agreement, um, that's a non-monetary contract, essentially, between the government and a, and a contractor, um, to, whether it be to exchange labor, resources, intellectual property, those kinds of things. We want to educate them on what AFRL does, um, how to apply to our monetary, our contracts that are monetary awarding, like BAAs, like SIBRs, like OTAs. And so that way, when we do all the cool basic research, they can follow us back into the laboratory um, to that applied research work to as applicable. So that's a, that's a great question to bring up is, is I definitely did miss talking about that connection is we're talking about basic research in this environment, but then making that connection from that basic research and those partnerships back into our community um, is, is very important. And we want to enable that open front door to those through the basic research avenue because that will be able to allow us to open that door to the broadest capability um, applicable as part of that. And so one of the things that I had talked about um, on the corporate side is making sure that um, our small business guys who do, do the work with the SIBRs and the SITRs and then have access to the whole Air Force SIBR program as a result of that they're, they've committed to sitting part-time actually in the facility, just working with these small businesses and making sure they know all of their opportunities. Um, so, you know, you've mentioned the pitch day and I think you went to one down in New York City. So I know that's kind of like a new model. I've never actually been mm -hmm. involved in one. Can, can you maybe just provide a little bit more like what, what, so what happens at one of those? What actually goes on? Sure. And um, so it's a, it's a model that's really being pushed um, from our highest level of acquisitions um, from Dr. Roper, um, as well as other groups saying, look, in order to get small businesses working with us, it's, it's a huge financial impact to them if we can't award a contract for even two months um, in order to be able to sustain the, the great talent and the labor and everything that comes along with that, if you've only got a three or four person shop, a, a two month delay on having a contract re awarded is huge. And so that can deter small businesses from working with us. So they really wanted to focus on um, that capability and getting into those small business communities quicker, better, faster. So they kind of came up with this pitch day concept where they invited people to pitch ideas on specific challenge areas. So the there was one recently down in New York City specifically for AIML that was put on and sponsored by the Joint AI Center to to do that work. And so they were able to do all the contracting and work ahead of time. So that way when they got to the pitch day and said, look, I'm interested in that. I've had enough technical conversation on it. We've done it back and forth. I want to give you 100K to continue this work, which is huge for a small business. That'll get them over a couple couple months worth of work to continue this and continue those conversations with us. Here's 100K, give me your credit card. We're loading it on that money on it for you today. And so that was um, a huge impact to the community and it was huge outreach effort as well um, in order to be able to have gained that level of trust with that community and say, look, they really meant it. Yeah. And so by doing all of that work up front, so in doing it in compliance with federal acquisition regulations, all of that, but being prepared for it, all we had to do was essentially put in the company names and the final amounts on the contracts and say, all right, let's, let's do work today. Um, not, all right, we're interested. Let's do work three months from now. <laughs> right. Let's start this work today, and thank you for everything that you're doing in this community. That's, I think that's incredible. I think, you know, and, you know, small businesses, uh, that, that can make a huge difference. Like you said, the, the time time lag and trying to get something mm -hmm. on, on contract can be uh, a big challenge, a big hurdle for a small business. So to be able yeah. to get something quickly to help them uh, get going or to keep going, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's huge. 
And, and the federal acquisition regulations are in place for a reason, and it's really to protect the taxpayers that we are representing as the Department of Defense. But the, the acquisition regulations give us more flexibility than we realize sometimes, and that's where taking advantage of our current resources but looking at it in an out-of-the-box fashion is what really enabled the pitch days to happen, I think. got to most of the questions from our attendees. So okay. um, we've covered quite a bit of ground. I mean, unless there's something else uh, you like to add last minute or there otherwise? No, I just probably want to take the opportunity to thank everyone again. Um, if you've got any other ideas or uh, way forward on everything, uh, please shoot me an email. My email was at the beginning of the presentation that, again, that I believe Sisiak is going to be sending out the slides on to everyone. So you should have access to that uh, right after this presentation is done. Yeah, and then and then I'll just mention, you know, if anybody has any other questions that, uh, after the fact, uh, you know, you can contact Karen directly or. Uh, if there's something that you think you might want to share with the broader community, you can send it to uh, info at csiac.org, and um, you know we can help to answer the question and also disseminate that out to uh, to our, our our community as well. So, uh, Karen, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, let the folks know about the uh, the Open Innovation Campus that you're you're developing here. Uh, I think it's you know, the, uh, the areas, uh, the quantum, neuromorphic computing, AI, ML, um, they're, they're, you know, potentially going to have a big in, impact on the future and look forward to see what, uh, you know, you're able to uh, generate from this. Well, and thank you so much for having us. Uh, we appreciate it at AFRL. And thank you to DTIC as well for everything that they do for, for this, this organization. I just want to thank everybody for joining us, and uh, uh, we look forward to uh, having uh, having you uh, join us in the future. I think we're hoping to have a, uh, a October webinar on uh, uh, cyber survivability. Um, we're looking at the 24th, but I got to double check uh, the date and confirm that. But uh, uh, like I said, look forward to seeing you again next month. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Goodbye now.